a guy who was uh, beaten into uh, the stump by some number of months. Vivek Ramaswamy joins us right now. Uh, Vivek, good to have you back. Yeah, it's good to be on. How are you? Very good. Let me ask you first about what you make of uh, what's going to be a busy week of add-ons to the Republican presidential contest, beginning with Chris Christie tonight and ending, we're told, by the end of the week with uh, North Dakota's governor. Getting pretty crowded out there. What do you think? It is. The first thing I'll say is more competition is good. We as a party need to define what we stand for and why we stand for it. I think the debate stage is going to be critical for helping define that agenda. I believe our campaign is already leading the way in defining that agenda. And so I invite the competition. I think that's a good thing. I don't want to hide from it. Do you think to the you'll contrary, make, do you though, think I you'll do think that, that debate stage? Oh, we're already on the debate stage. So we've actually made the debate stage in May. We hit the 40,000 unique donor threshold and the other criteria as well. Some of the other candidates, I think, were complaining that the criteria were set too high. I'm a first-time politician who's never had a donor in my life. We crossed it three months in advance of the debate itself. So I feel very good about where we are. More importantly, though, I think, Neil, people are hungry for an outsider. I think it is going to be the tradition of the Republican Party to nominate somebody who's not a professional politician into the White House. I predict that's going to be the new GOP tradition. I think our base is hungry for that. I am the outsider in this race, and I think it takes an outsider to take on the administrative state, to declare independence from China, to revive our national pride in a way that existing professional politicians just aren't really getting done. And that's why I'm in this race. You know, um, you're one of the wealthier candidates in this race, uh, worth in excess of 600 million. I don't know. It's a moving target. Let's suffice to say you're a wealthy guy. Uh, but there are other, uh, you know, party types who are focusing on bigger business types like Jamie Dimon to make a run for it, not necessarily as a Republican, uh, but just to make a run for it because we need a business titan in there. That's the that's the view. What do you think of that? I think that view is shallow and superficial. I'm not running on the premise of saying that because I know how to run a business effectively and I am self-made, I didn't inherit my wealth. I built it through multi-billion dollar companies that I've built from scratch. But I'm not saying that that's what qualifies me to run for president. That's a tired pitch. You hear that once every election cycle. I'm running on a vision for our country, a vision on what it actually means to be an American. I think of myself as a George Washington, America first conservative, reviving the ideals of the American Revolution. Neil, you and I have been talking for a couple of years. I've written three books in the last 18 months. Those aren't usual candidate books. Those are books that actually lay out a specific vision of what's wrong with the merger of state power and private power in our country, the real threats to liberty today. So I'm running on that vision, and it so happens I'm doing it as somebody who has lived the full arc of the American dream, unconstrained by being a traditional politician. Well, I, I will give you credit. You are looking at issues that others have not. You were ahead of issues that others didn't even really comprehend. Uh, you wrote quite literally the book on wokeism, whatever you call it, woke ink, before yeah. others seized on it here. But now I'm wondering about whether in, in this crowded field you separate yourself all the more. A lot of people give you high marks for your hard work and, and just your work ethic. I think Steve Wynn had advised you that you should be making people feel good about themselves. I, I guess you had a chance meeting that was arranged with him. I'm talking to Casino Mogul. Was he telling you that that's what you lacked? He was telling me that that's what he saw the potential in me that was different than others in the field, which is I take advice from everyone. That was the good piece of advice I took from him. Reagan was the last president to do that well. And part of my mission, Neil, is to revive our sense of national self-confidence. That's part of what our mis we're missing. We doubt ourselves as a country. Young people across this country doubt themselves as individuals. Yeah. One of the things that I've seen is this country gave me the chance to live the full arc of the American dream. I'm the first millennial ever to run for the GOP nomination for U.S. president at the age of 37. I'm doing it in a self-funded way with small dollar donors to help us. I've put eight figures of my own money into this campaign already to declare independence from the donor class. That's an American dream story. And I think that we can use that to revive self-confidence. And part of what I'm trying to do is help people see for themselves why we still have it in us as Americans for our best days to still be ahead of us. I don't think we're a nation in decline. 
I think we're a nation in ascent on our way to the mountaintop. And when you see it that way, I just think the problems we're going through now are really going through our version of adolescence. You lose your self-confidence in adolescence. That's okay. We'll get to adulthood on the other side. But part of what I'm doing is trying my best to lead us to something, not just running from something like I see a lot of other Republicans doing. Well, a lot of them are very cautious when it comes to advising how we deal with China. You've put it out there that we, yeah. we've got to prevent U.S. companies from doing business with China, or a lot of them. But are you prepared to tell the American people that in doing that, uh, they're going to pay a lot more for Chinese goods? So would you do like an FDR type speech to say uh, this is well worth the pain and suffering it's going to cause here? Because that will cause a lot of pain and suffering here. So I would. I also would ban the CCP or its affiliates from buying land in this country. That might make it harder to sell your land. You're but talking I about think the we Chinese can make Communist these short Party, runs. Go ahead. Well, I mean, the, the, the reality is that we can make these sacrifices if we know what we're sacrificing for over the long run. That is this thing we call America. And I think that the secret in geopolitics is it's when you're most willing to make a sacrifice that you probably won't have to make one at all. What I've said is we will cut the cord from China unless the CCP dramatically reforms its behaviors, including turning companies into geopolitical pawns, including requiring data of U.S. users for companies to enter the Chinese market. That's the ref kind of reform I'm going to demand. Xi Jinping, Neil, I think you may know this well, has a tougher hand than we do right now if we have the spine and courage to open our eyes up and actually see it. So no, I predict no, I, if I'm I, sitting I across under, the table from I, I Xi Jinping, I he will fold. I understand that, Vivek. I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is uh, to play tough with China, it boomerangs back on us. You're quite right. There are a lot of people and a lot of countdowning yes. going on right now uh, with China. Uh, and there's a concern among a lot of U.S. businesses and titans from Jamie Dimon to Elon Musk to Bill Gates, who all say to a man that it would be risky and boomerang to the degree that it hurts us just as much. You don't agree with that. I disagree with that. I disagree with that. First of all, I think they're making it out to be harder than it actually needs to be because it serves their self-interest to say so. I would, and this is where I depart from Trump a little bit, I would reopen trade relationships with Japan, South Korea, India, Southeast Asian countries, Australia, that put us in a strong position from supply chain perspectives and otherwise to actually stand with conviction across the table from Xi Jinping. Yes, it's impossible to bring all of that to the United States on day one. I love bringing it to the United States, but we need to fill the gap with other Pacific trade partners, even Brazil, Mexico, and other trading partners, too. But if we do that, I think this becomes a lot more achievable than some of the self-interested business leaders that you named make it out to be to say that we can't cut that cord from China. Then we have a strong hand in our, in our possession. Then we stand with the spine across the table from Xi Jinping. I predict he'll fold. But even if he doesn't, we're ready to cut that cord to think on the time scales of history instead of on the time scales of two-year election cycles or a quarterly earnings report. I do think it's a national security risk for the United States to be dependent on our enemy for our modern way of life. Even when Reagan took on the USSR, they weren't putting the shoes on our feet or the phones in our pockets. That's the real risk we need to wake up to on the foreign policy grounds. And I think I'm the leading candidate in the race who both understands it and has a very clear plan to deliver independence from China in a way that minimizes minimizes harm to Americans, but is also, as you said, Neil, honest with Americans, as I will be, that there's some short-term inconvenience we may incur, but that's what's worth it for actually having a long-run future for our next generation. Very interesting, Vivek. We'll see what happens. Thank you very much, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, on that 2024 presidential candidate. He has been ahead of a lot of these issues, while others have ignored them and taken on some controversial ones at that.